We are live. Welcome to the My Show Horse app's first ever Dressage Stars Google Hangout series. Located at showhorseapp.com, My Show Horse Checklist is an online tool designed to assist in packing your horse trailer for shows, clinics, lessons, whatever horse related event it is that you need to haul your horse to. Please come on over and get a $97 value copy of Seven Secrets to Improve Your Dressage Scores 25% in One Month, guaranteed. I am your hostess, Patricia Rezzatello, and today I am very pleased to present Dan Sumerall of Sumerall Training. Hi, Dan. Hi there, Patricia. How are you? <laughs> I'm doing just fine. It's really nice to have you here with us today. It's nice to be here. Now, Dan is a bit of an exception to our Dressage Star series in that he's not a dressage specific uh, clinician. Uh, but the reason he's here, though, is because he understands horse behavior extremely well. And I think most equestrians really, really don't. Um, and he is also an expert horse therapist. Dan is also an author, and he has shared his story here in this book. Finding the Magic, and I highly recommend that you get a copy of this book, read it through, um, have you know sticky notes with you so you can scribble on notes and stick them in the book. Have a highlighter, you know, mark this thing up. It's it's not just a story; it's a textbook, and you want to take notes for you know when you get out there with your horse. Um, things that you're going to want to do, things you're going to want to look for, things you're going to want to pay attention to. Um, I've been in horses for almost 40 years, and you know, there's always something new to learn, and Dan's an excellent source to go to. If you don't have a copy of this book, get it as soon as you can. Go up on Amazon. You know, they can have it to your door in a couple days. Uh, it's a very good investment. So, to learn how this all developed, we need to go back to the beginning. Dan, would you share with us how you got involved with horses way, way back in the beginning? Well, my way back in the beginning was about 24 years ago. Uh, unlike probably many of the people that are on this show, um, I didn't grow up around horses. Uh, I actually grew up around motorcycles and cars, racing. Uh, when I was in the Air Force, uh, I was on B-52 bombers, and then when I got out of the Air Force, I went back to cars and motorcycles, worked for Yamaha and so on, and really had nothing at all to do with horses. Uh, by a sheer moment in fate that uh, changed my life. Uh, when I was 41, I bought a horse. Uh, I'd sold a business, I had some time on my hands, and I always loved horses on TV, but never was around them. I bought a horse, started riding, and immediately fell in love with trail riding and the horses. Uh, had a beautiful little Arabian. And then I got swept up into a thing that most horse people today still do, and I hear this all the time. If, if you meet somebody who has horses, it, it's a written rule that you have to ask them two questions. And the first question you have to ask them is, what kind of horses do you have? And, and they will say paints or Appaloosas or quarter horses or Arabians or warm-blooded whatevers. The second question is, what do you do with your horses? And they will respond with the, well, I, you know, uh, I do dressage uh, in Alabama. They call it dressage sometimes or whatever. But uh, I jump, I do shows, uh, I race barrels. But they'll all talk about what their sport is. And, and then occasionally, sometimes quite often, I get people who will say, well, almost apologetically, I, 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 I just trail ride. And I really wish they wouldn't say it that way because when I say I trail ride, I think you should scream, I trail ride. I don't have to go through all the riff and raff and all the rest of the stuff that so many horse people do to have fun with their horses. Trail riders just get on the horse and head off into the woods or someplace and have a good time. So I was the trail rider type. Um, I, I guess that I, I got into endurance racing by almost accident because you kind of have to have a purpose when you're spending so much money on horses. 
when I got into endurance riding, I realized that I couldn't run the same horse every weekend, and I wanted to ride a lot, and I was getting really interested in it. So I went out and bought my own horse, uh, and the horse that I bought is the horse on the cover of my book, the second horse to be an endurance horse. His name is Sonny, and his, he's the reason I'm here. He's what changed my life. Many of you can look back on moments that changed your life. Buying Sonny was that moment for me. He was a rogue stallion. He reared, he bucked, he kicked, he struck. He had rolled over people that tried to ride him. He had scraped people off on fences that tried to ride him. He had been ridden, but not a lot. And many of you not right now are probably questioning my sanity and saying, why would a somewhat novice horse person buy a rogue stallion? And the answer is quite simple. I had an extremely good reason. He's really pretty. And many of you will laugh, but many of you have bought horses for the very same reason. When I bought the horse, I didn't have any idea what I was in for, but I just felt that I had to have this horse. When I bought him, I was able to catch him, saddle him, and ride him, which many people had not been able to do. And our first four rides in the mountains of Colorado were absolutely fantastic. He was fast, he was agile, he was beautiful, he was wonderful to ride. The next ride, not so much. We were about three miles from home. He decided we were going back early. He turned around and we went home in a flat out gallop. That was my first experience on a runaway horse. And uh, it was also quite an eye opener. Now I must interject that had I not been a motorcycle racer, car racer, my hobby before was jumping out of perfectly good airplanes. Had I not been involved with activities like that, being on a runaway horse for three and a half miles in the mountains of Colorado, so we're not talking about a 30 second runaway lap around an arena or something. This went on for 15 minutes. And I probably wouldn't have dealt with it as well as I did, but I saw it more of it as a challenge. It was very exciting, and I liked the excitement of it. So I continued to ride the horse. After the fourth such runaway, and mind you, we're talking about runaways that were three, four, and five miles in duration, through the mountains of Colorado on trails that were pretty exciting at a trot, at a gallop, they were uh, different. Uh, at that point, I started to look for help. And in the horse world, if you have trouble with a horse, you are taught to find a trainer. And trainers are supposed to have the answers. So I hired a trainer and, to help me with my horse to stop the runaways. I then hired another trainer when that trainer failed. I then hired another trainer. And over the next eight months of my life, I went through five different trainers, one girl, two men, four men, excuse me, one girl, four men. And I also experienced 43 runaways on Sunday. So I think I probably qualify in the Guinness Book as having the most time in the saddle of a runaway horse of anyone probably. But that's not necessarily a title you want to brag about, I guess. I am happy about it because I survived and I'm still here, and that's a good point. But the bottom line was when the five trainers who tried severe bits, we tried some of the most severe bits you've ever seen, None of the bits ever stopped the horse. The trainers, four of the men, all four of the men, were unable to ride the horse. And if you think about it, if a horse refuses, absolutely refuses to be ridden, his size and his strength is going to make this a very awkward situation. Sonny's not that big. He's about 850 pounds, about 14, 2 to 3. But he would roll over people. He would buck. He would run you into the fence, whatever he did. And he was successful in not having people ride him. Yet he was letting me ride him three or four times a week. So this was a kind of a conundrum to me at the time. Later I realized he didn't want to throw me off. He didn't want to not go for the rides. He just wanted to be in charge. He wanted control. And I had no way to take control back from him. The bits didn't work. The tie downs he broke. The four trainers that I was paying money, the males never rode him. The girl trainer did ride him, but only in the round pen because she was scared to death of the horse. This is the same horse that me, the neophyte, was riding three or four or five times a week in the woods. And most of the time, loving it. The urgent return home trips with Sonny being in control were not fun. But they also gave me a perspective because most people never ride their horse at 100% of what the horse can do. Most people ride their horse at 30, 40, 50, 60% 
of what the horse can do. And if the horse really starts to be extremely fast, people get panicky, slow the horse down, get off, whatever. I got to experience what a horse, when he's in charge, going where he wants to go as fast as he wants to go, I got to experience what that was like. And I will tell you, many times in those runaways, he would go into a group of woods and a tight trail at a speed that I knew we were both going to die. We didn't die. He could do it. And not only do we not die, but he never even banged my leg into a tree or anything of that nature. And I wasn't that great a rider either then. And many times I would get out of position where he could have pitched me on my head in a blink, but he didn't do that either. He would move underneath me. So I hope your listeners can appreciate this was kind of somewhat of a unique experience. Many people have been on runaways, but not to the extent that I was, not necessarily in the same environment and terrain that I was. And some of them didn't survive as I did. So that, in essence, was my introduction to horses. And that horse and that experience changed my life. Because after eight months of the runaways, the trainer's lack of success, the trainers came to me and said as a group, you need to kill this horse. Because if you don't kill this horse, he's going to kill you. You can't sell him because you know he's a runaway. If you sell him and he kills or hurts somebody else, they'll come back and sue you. So the dilemma now was, what do I do? I love the horse. He's still very pretty. And I'm not going to kill the horse. So I had sold a business. I had a lot of time on my hands. I put the horse in a pasture. And I went to find somebody, some trainer, who could fix this horse. And I started going to clinic after clinic after clinic. I liked the idea of what they called natural horsemanship. Although in many situations today, the name natural applied to horsemanship is completely bogus. But I went to these clinicians and these trainers, Buck Branneman, Ray Hunt, Pat Pirelli, John Lyons, Monty Roberts, Richard Schrake, you name it, I went there. I also bought their stupid sticks and halters and ropes and all the other paraphernalia they will sell you in order to be natural with a horse. And being an adult, knowing I didn't know much about horses, but also having a fairly logical mind, I kept asking myself, why do I need all this stuff to be natural on a horse? Now, I know a lot of you have beautiful tack, beautiful bridles, beautiful saddles, ornate things, and I appreciate all of that. But to me, the horse is the most beautiful when there's nothing on the horse. And so when I end up in a saddle, I ride in a dressage saddle. Not that I'm a dressage trained rider, but because it's the smallest, most perfectly fitting saddle that I could find. Fitting me, fitting the horse in the opposite order. I also don't use bits, don't use shoes, and there's a lot of other things like that that I learned later on. But working with this horse and going to these different clinicians, I went to clinic after clinic after clinic after clinic for months. And would you be surprised if I said I got a bit confused? I heard different things. I heard the same things. I heard a lot of odd things. But after the eight months and all the stuff and all that I went through and after all the clinics, I went back, put Sonny in a round pen, and in about six weeks, I was riding him with a halter and no more runaways. And that was a major change. And I'm not sure exactly at that time, I wasn't sure how I did it. I was trying to emulate what I'd seen in the clinics, and I did the best that I could. And in six weeks, the result was pretty impressive. And at that point, people began to come to me and say stupid things like, Dan, you must have the gift. Or Dan, you must be a whisperer, which I thought was rather absurd. But the follow-up comment they would always make is, you know, I've got this horse that's a pain in the butt, and she's so-and-so, and blah, blah, blah. And you want to see, you did so good with Sonny. Would you ride, would you work with my horse and see if you can fix her too or fix him too? And I was so naive, I said, sure. And that was the beginning of my business, retraining problem horses. The horses that I worked with taught me more than all the clinicians, I think. But the one person who actually did help me the most was a man I got to work with shortly after all this transpired, a man named Gunther Gable Williams, who was the head trainer for the Ringling Brothers Circus. He passed away a few years ago, but he was an incredible, incredible individual. 
And he not only worked with horses, but lions and tigers and leopards and elephants, you name it. And one of the things that he told me very much in the beginning, he says, if you want to control a horse, which is what we're talking about here, when you have runaways or you have behavioral problems, you're talking about controlling the horse. He says, if you want to control any animal, he says, first thing you do, and this is going to be hard for some of your listeners to do, sit down and shut up. Stop talking to the horse. Stop thinking so much and watch the horse. Learn about the horse's behavior and how he interacts with his other horses. And use what is, here comes that word, natural to the horse as far as behavior goes. And control the horse using what you learn. After talking to Gunther and being around Gunther for a couple of weeks, it really changed my perception and my attitude towards horses. And that got me on a different path. That combined with the thousands of horses I've worked with in the last 20 years uh, has brought me to where we are today. And it was a beginning that you probably couldn't write if you were doing fiction, but it was an experience to live through that I wouldn't trade for anything. And it has changed my life and in fact allowed me to change the lives of thousands of people around the world training and to help thousands of horses. And that's something I'm very thankful for. Yeah, uh, certainly if you hadn't had experience with motorcycles and race cars and jumping out of good airplanes, anybody else would have said, no, I'm out of here. <laughs> that kind of runaways, my goodness. So what do you think is the single most important thing that you have learned about horses over the years? I think the single most important thing I've learned about horses is to not listen to what the horse industry is telling me about horses. But as Gunther said, study the horses, watch the horses, and go by what they do. Uh, we people, we human beings, are the top species on the planet, and we want to ride the horse. We want to do whatever activity it is with the horse. So we grab the horse and we start trying to get the horse to accept what we want them to do. And God bless them, horses are so adaptable and so pleasant in so many ways that most horses really, really try to do what we're asking. But there's often a communication problem. And I think when I say not listen to what the industry tells us about horses, I'm talking about so many of the myths that have been created that are taken as gospel truth. Uh, so when I was working with the horses, certain fundamentals started to show up for me. Things that seemed obvious after what Gunther said, but somehow have missed the translation into what the horse industry teaches for the most part. Uh, and I'll give you a couple of examples. When you're trying to control a horse, what you are really trying to control is the movement of his body. Now, as simplistic as that sounds, if you think about it, if you are trying to put a horse in a trailer, are you not trying to control the movement of his body and have him go in the trailer? You can take your cocker spaniel, and if you have to put him in the truck, you can pick him up and put him in the truck. That approach doesn't work when you're dealing with a thousand-pound horse. The horse has to go along with what you're asking. But what we're trying to do is control the movement of his body. If you want to get more complicated or more simplistic, if you want to pick up his foot, people try to pick up the foot to clean out the foot. If the horse is standing on the foot, you can't pick up the foot. And as soon as he agrees to let you do what you need to do, when he agrees to let the foot be picked up, we all know it takes an ounce of pressure or nothing to pick up a foot that a half a minute ago you couldn't move with all your force. So the issue that arises here is that no matter what you're trying to do, it relates to controlling the movement of the horse's body. If you're a dressage rider, which many people listening here are, dressage is very much about controlling the movement of the horse's body. You're asking for very specific movements. You're asking for very detailed movements. And many people lose a performance at a dressage show competition, not because they got thrown off, bucked off, or their horse jumped out of the arena, but because the horse simply wasn't quite as good with his movement of his body 
in those details that are so critical. So if you're looking to control the movement of the body, the industry tells us, go after that part of the body. If he won't go, get spurs, get a whip. If he won't turn, use your spurs, hit him on the side, turn his head. If he won't stop, get a stronger bit. If he carries his head too high, get a tie down and crank it down. In other words, the application of some type of apparatus or equipment to control the movement of the horse's body. As I mentioned earlier, tie downs on Sonny were just an exercise of seeing how strong his neck was until he broke it. The reality is that when you were trying to pick up that foot, for instance, when you couldn't do it, his mind was saying, nope, I'm standing on the foot, too bad. When he changed his mind about what you asked from him, and he agreed that you could pick up the foot. Picking up the foot becomes a non-event requiring no effort on your part at all. So even though we're trying to control the movement of the body of the horse, in any activity we do, it always goes back to the attitude and mind of the horse. So if you can change your horse's attitude to where when you ask for something, he will try to do it, you don't need all the tack and equipment, force, treats, screaming, or any of the other things that are so common in the horse industry. Because the horse's mind is what defines what his body will or will not do. And fortunately for us, being smaller than horses, and I'm not a great big guy. I'm 5'8", 155, 60 pounds, so I'm not real big. Compared me to the smallest horse, I'm not real strong or powerful. Compare me to a big horse, I'm nothing. So making a physical war start to control something that's much, much bigger and stronger and faster than me, that seems like it's kind of stupid. I see people doing it all the time, but I don't want to get into a physical struggle with something that's going to overpower me anytime it wants to. Having said that, the question is, how do we change their mind? And that's what I learned to do and that's what I teach, and that's what my book is about, getting away from the tack, getting away from the force, and working with a horse at liberty, which is how all horses live almost all the time. And if they had their choice, they would live at liberty all the time. Horses control other horses while all those horses are loose. You never hear a boss mare in a herd, a lead horse in a herd, Say, oh, time out, i got to go in the barn and get my so-and-so so I can control this other horse that's underneath me in the packing order. They don't do that. They control each other by changing the other horse's attitude and gaining the horse's respect. Not fear, but respect. Now, there's a degree of fear in the horse world and the animal world by animals that are higher on the hierarchy than the lower animals. But for the most part, they avoid conflict and they deal with it because it has been already decided who is going to lead the dance. We need to work with our horses at liberty, have the horse agree to let us lead the dance. And by doing that, we have the horse's mind, we have his attitude, he gives us control of his body in levels that we couldn't take with force. I know that sounds simplistic. But I think that's where most of the horse industry has gone wrong. And part of that is because of commercialization. Part of it's because of ego and certain people. A lot of reasons for it. But fundamentally, the, the most important thing that I teach is forget about the horse's body. Go after his mind and his attitude. And once you've got his mind, the body comes along with no sweat. Yeah, that's that's definitely how it works. Now, how did you connect the concept of horse being in pain to misbehavior or poor performance? Well, that was one more of those life-changing moments that I ran into. And as I've already, I think, illustrated with my conversation, I'm not always the smartest guy in the planet. Uh, probably getting back on for the 44th, 43rd, 42nd, 41st, 39th runaway, maybe because some people would have considered a bad judgment. 
So I don't always do things right. But I do try to learn from my mistakes. Uh, when I was in first in endurance racing, I was in South Dakota for one time doing a, a race called the Race of Champions. It was 100 miles in a day, one one mile race. Uh, I'll never forget it because as, as I was on the ride, I could look up and see Mount Rushmore. And it was just the best way in the world to see Mount Rushmore is when you're riding a horse through the woods and there's Mount Rushmore. But before the race, when everybody gets there a few days earlier to settle in and everything, I had noticed a group of people with several horses standing around, and some people had some equipment out, little small pieces of equipment. One machine was going beep, beep, beep around the horses, and the other machine had red and different colored lights, and they were working on these horses. And I thought this was the dumbest, funniest looking thing I had ever seen, and I wanted to know what the devil these people were doing. So I walked over. And I started making all kind of jokes and cracks and things of the nature. And uh, the whole idea of what they were doing, they were scanning a horse or something with this one thing that went beep, beep, and trying to find physical problems. And then they were putting lights on the problems to help the body heal. And I thought this was hysterical. I made some really great funny jokes about it. And then this woman hit me in the ribs with her elbow. And she said, don't you laugh at this until you see how this can help your horse. And she was one of the top endurance racers in the country at the time. And I looked at her. I said, do you use this electronic voodoo junk? And she says, you bet I do. And she said, you should be using it too. And I says, all right, show me how your electric voodoo works. Now, that cynical first impression was my first introduction to the therapy equipment for which I would later own the company. I saw them work on horses with this machine that would locate where problems are. And if I can digress one second, if you stop and think about it, when you have a horse that is not moving well, not performing well, lame, uh, there's all sorts of myths in the horse industry and, and misconceptions about what do you do about that. I, I remember asking a lady not too long ago, I said, how's your horse doing? She says, oh, he's not lame, he's just great. Now that's the most absurd thing you could say because that's assuming that a lame horse has problems and a horse who is not lame is all right. And to answer that, I would give you a suggestion. Is it not possible that you or I or any of your listeners could have cancer, tuberculosis, emphysema, uh, AIDS, all kinds of horrible abnormalities, diseases, problems that can be life-threatening but not one of those are going to make us limp. So if we assess the horse's physical condition by whether or not he's lame, we are missing an enormous number of problems that may need to be addressed. Well, with this equipment, the scanner, using existing physiology that every doctor learns in first year med school, goes over the horse's body externally and it beeps whenever it finds a physical problem. It'll even beep loud when it's serious or beep very softly when it's a minor problem. And it can find muscle problems, joint problems, tendons, ligaments. It can also pick up active acupuncture points, which are indicative of internal or systemic or structural problems. Uh, as they scanned over the horse, they would actually take a little water crayon, every place the scanner beep, put a mark on the horse. And a lot of the horses had a lot of marks. So then they go back and to treat or to help stimulate the body to heal, they use a red and infrared light therapy device. Now, many of your listeners have probably heard of therapeutic lasers, and, and that is one type of light production device used therapeutically. Surgical lasers are designed to cut, and they do extremely well at that. Therapeutic lasers or soft lasers or cold lasers are used not to cut, but to stimulate the body to heal. They're very effective. If any of your uh, listeners happen to be doctors or nurses or will like technical information and you haven't heard of this or you're not sure that I know what I'm talking about, go online and Google NASA therapy or NASA laser therapy or NASA LED therapy. And I'm talking about NASA, the Space Administration. They have done more research on this. They have hundreds and hundreds of pages of clinical studies validating what we're talking about and even more than that they have used light therapy in the space program for over 37 years so this is not something that I made up or somebody else made up this is something that goes back decades and evolved from the first lasers built as a weapon 
the doctor is saying, let's make a surgical laser, a little bitty laser that might be a good surgical tool, which they succeeded in doing. And during those development times, finding out that, that surgical laser was also helping those tissues heal faster. And that is where the, is the therapeutic lasers and the cold lasers evolve from. So when I was at this endurance race and I saw these horses getting scanned and then getting treated with this light therapy, which is no relationship to light beer, the light therapy was new to me, but I saw it work. And to me, only a fool would see something work over and over with consistency and ignore it. So I saw it work on several horses. I took the horse that I was going to ride in the event over, who it wasn't bending as well to the left as he was to the right. And they were found a few problems, treated them with the lights. The next day when I rode him, he was not only freer and faster in his movement, but he was bending left and right like a dream. So about a week later, I bought one of these systems from the company. And the original company was called Bioscam. For nine years, I worked with Bioscam because I then had the ability to evaluate every horse that I came in contact with using the scanner. And the idea to me of, of trotting out a lame horse to see where he's lame, which is the way it's done frequently, if a horse is lame, that means there's something wrong someplace, and having him trot on that lame, problematic, troubled area is not the best thing in the world to do. But if you have no other alternative, that's what you do to. And I will tell you, I am terrible at watching a lame horse trot out and tell you where the problem is. Even after 21 years of working in the horse world, and the reason I'm so bad at it is because I don't have to do it. I've never done it, and I don't try to do it, so I've never learned how to do it well. I don't need it because I have the scanner. Here again, another point that the industry promotes that most of us buy into that is invalid is that when you have a horse that's lame or bent or not bending or, or not doing well or running slow, then you also are taught to look for the problem. Find the problem. Where's the problem? Consequently, when you see or find some obvious problem, further evaluation of the horse's body often stops. Now, I have used this equipment to scan and treat over 6,000 horses as of about a year ago when I quit counting. Never have I found a horse with one problem. Horses always have multiple problems because they hide and compensate and so on. So the scanner, again, not only gives us the ability to pinpoint where the problems are, but to find those problems that don't always show up. Now, when I started using this equipment, a little light bulb went off in the back of my somewhat empty head and told me, you know, when you feel bad, Dan, when you're really hurting somewhere or you're tired or you're miserable, even if you're just hungry, sometimes you get grumpy. And that's true of most of us, I think. And then I thought, well, maybe the horse who is sore or hurting physically is being a defensive butthead because he hurts. Maybe he doesn't have a bad attitude. Maybe he's just hurting. Just like most of your listeners, if they had a migraine headache, they may not be in a happy mood right now either. So a lot of the horses that I was hired to retrain, I'll never forget one of the first really expensive multi-hundred-thousand-dollar horses I was brought in to work on was in Dallas. And the first thing I did with the horse was to take the equipment and scan him, and I found a lot of different physical problems. His hamstrings, his hips were a wreck, his neck on one side was a mess, he had cervical vertebra out, a lot of acupuncture points showing up. Not uncommon, but this horse had a lot of physical issues. I scanned him, I treated the problems, treated the problems again that night, Scan him the next morning again. Some of the problems were already gone. Treated there was problems again that day. In two days of working on the horse for his physical problems, his attitude and his demeanor changed 180 degrees. So from that point forward, I realized that a lot of these horses who are resistant to going or ill-mannered or a horse who used to be real nice is now irritable all the time, there's a reason for that. But if we can't find the reason, we can't fix it. And I had the scanner, and the scanner gives me the ability to find the physical problems that may not be readily apparent. And you being a dressage rider, and many of your listeners being dressage riders, I, I will give you an example of this. Uh, at the 96 Olympics in Atlanta, Dr. Grintz, who was a vet for the German Olympic size team, uh, I had met him previously at Long Beach Grand Prix. He saw our equipment. He said, if this does what you say it does, I will buy one. He bought one. 
and at the Olympics was one of the first times he actually got to use the equipment. Isabel Wirth is a girl who was at that point on the German Olympic dressage team at the Atlanta Olympics in 96. I watched her ride her horse, who was a stunningly beautiful animal, and the trainer and her were both, pardon the word, bitching like crazy in German, and they were not happy about the movement of the horse. I will preface that by telling you I have ridden a Grand Prix dressage horse. The horse is much smarter than I am because I am not a Grand Prix dressage rider, not cool that way at all. But the horse was magnificent to ride, even with my limited abilities due to the coaching of the owner. Embarrassing to have the horse so much smarter than I was, but it was fun. Having said that, I thought Isabel's horse looked pretty good. But when you're at the level in dressage of trying to win an Olympic medal, you are focused on details. It's not if the horse is lame, it's the details that matter. Extension, movement, getting underneath himself, impulsion, rounding out, things of that nature that the dressage people live for. This horse was not doing it at the level he would need to win. Dr. Grintz scanned that horse, treated that horse several times over a two-day period, and by the second day, the second day, Isabel and the trainer were giddy at the improvement in the movement of the horse. And when she won two gold medals at those Olympics, we got a great thank you note from her. Now, that's one example. I've also worked on 54 horses who were about to be put down. And 53 of the 54, we were able to save because we could find a lot of problems and treat not just the most obvious situation that was causing the problem, but all of the problems in the horse's body. So uh, about nine years after I got involved with this, the Bioscan company went out of business, not due to the product, but due to the management. At that point in time, I was not happy because I had used the product very successfully. I loved it. The engineer who designed and built and manufactured the Bioscan product called me and asked me if I would like to have my own line of Bioscan type equipment with the scanner and light therapy so I could continue this therapy type work. I agreed, but whenever you put a product in the market, the public gets a hold of it, you find weaknesses. And the Bioscan equipment had some mechanical and electrical structural problems. We fixed all of those. We redesigned the Bioscan concept into what became the Summerell therapy system. We went to all digital electronics, we fixed wiring problems, we fixed manufacturing difficulties. We've everything that had broken on a Bioscan, we fixed it. And we launched that about 12 years ago. And so for 12 years now, we've been using what we call the Summerell therapy system. And it goes hand in hand with my training work, again, because you cannot separate the physical performance of a horse with the mental attitude of the horse. Those two areas overlap. Horses, people, dogs, you name it. But the problem people have with horses is they don't talk. They don't say, hey, my shoulder's killing me, my hip's killing me, my hamstring's hurt, my left hock is really messed up. In fact, they try to hide it as a prey animal because they know that any predators watching the herd are going to focus on whoever's limping the worst. So they don't want to limp. They don't want to show you they hurt. They try to hide it. But hiding it by compensation means they take load off of an injured area and put it on a healthy area, which means now the healthy area is overloaded, and sooner or later some of the healthy areas start to become sore and impaired as well. First thing you know over a period of time, when we keep riding the horse and riding the horse and competing on the horse, all these sore problem having areas get worse and worse and worse, and they overlap themselves. So having this tool has been an enormous advantage for me as a trainer, and the people that use this absolutely swear by it. And before anybody asks, yes, it works great on dogs, cats, and people. There isn't one of these systems that isn't used by the people that have it on themselves as much as they do their horses. Oh, I can imagine. I, I know if I have one or had one, I would certainly be using it on myself. <laughs> so what do you see as the core concepts that a rider, handler, you know, whoever it is that's doing stuff with a horse, um, what, what do they have to understand in order to, you know, optimize their experience together? I think the most important initial concept you have to have in this or most any other situations is an open mind. We tend to listen to the horse industry 
And the horse industry is not bad, but it is in most cases commercially driven. And when you have so many horses that are worth so much money, horses that are performing to win so much money or so much prestige, there's a lot at stake. And the egos get involved and the pride gets involved and all these other things. I would ask people to maintain an open mind and not to prejudge the horse as being bad in behavior without eliminating the fact that the horse has physical problems. That's number one. Number two is the fact that the control of the horse's body, like we talked about earlier, is so simple and so fundamental. To say that everything you do with a horse is always about controlling the movement of his body sounds overly simplistic, but I've been, the 15 years I've been teaching the concept, nobody's ever come up with something that doesn't relate to controlling the movement of their body. Well, if you keep the idea in, in your mind that it's the horse's mind that is controlling the movement of his body, and you stop trying to initiate these physical struggles, if you stop trying to solve movement problems with additional tack, then that open-mindedness is going to give you a reward from the behavior of the horse when you can change it, from the performance of the horse when he's not impaired with physical problems. Such a reward is pretty amazing. As an example, if you look back, the American Indians, the Native Americans, rode horses all over this country. They rode over some of the roughest, toughest terrain the country can offer. They rode without saddles, without shoes, without bits, without spurs, without training manuals, and they did it as a lifestyle. They rode horses in ways, I mean, they would fight wars on horseback. Imagine being in a group of several thousand mounted riders on one side of a valley, about to gallop into several thousand mounted riders on the other side of the valley who are your enemies and fight a war. This is probably the most terrific thing you could do on horseback, and they did it. And today people can't get their horse to walk through a puddle. What's wrong with this picture, folks? We have lost the connection with the horse as a living, thinking, breathing creature and turn the horse more into an appliance. I don't see the horse as an appliance. I see the horse as a living, breathing thing. I want the horse to do what I want it to do, but I want to make it a good deal for him, and he'll make it a good deal for me if I do it that way. Yeah. So why is a horse in pain in the first place? I mean, is it something that we're doing, something that we're not doing? What's the issue? Well, that's a great question. It really is, because people always say, you know, like I mentioned earlier, they have simplistic solutions for not doing anything, such as, well, my horse is, isn't lame, so he must be ready to go to the barrel race. When we do a competition with a horse, or if you're doing a competition yourself, any competition, whether it's tennis, football, running, or whether it's dressage, barrel racing, showing, jumping, or any of those sports, all of those sports require training, which requires repetitive motion. And many of those activities require not only repetitive motion, but repetitive motion at extreme limits of strength. When you use repetitive repetitive motion, things start to get tired, and since the owner doesn't necessarily know when something's tired, they may tend to keep going. Uh, it is possible in this country, in certain, many, many areas, for barrel racers to compete on their horses Wednesday night, Thursday night, Friday night, Saturday, Saturday night, and Sunday. Now, if you take your horse barrel racing three or four times a week, that's pretty strenuous. It would be like you running a race three or four times a week. And I'm not saying it to be critical of barrel racers. I love barrel racing. And if you're taking care of your horse's physical condition, you can compete frequently. Many people do. We are, our, our therapy business is very big in the barrel racing world because those horses work hard. So do team ropers. But so do dressage people. Dressage horses. And I, I'll share a story with you. The first Grand Prix dressage horse I ever worked on with the therapy equipment was many, many years ago in Denver. At a very expensive barn, very expensive horses, gorgeous, gorgeous, almost black bay mare, 
uh, brought out by the lady who owned the horse, obviously a very wealthy lady, very uh, pleasant person to be around. But she made a comment. She says, I don't know why my vet called to have you come out to scan this thing on your this equipment you use and scan my dressage horse because my dressage horse doesn't have a lot of physical problems. My dressage horse doesn't jump over things or gallop around like an idiot. My dressage horse is out there just performing to look great. Now, she totally missed the point of what a dressage horse is asked to do. And having worked with many, many, many dressage horses from Isabel's level on down, you're judged by details, as we said earlier. And any physical impairment that the horse had, or what if there's a physical impairment the rider's got a problem with, any physical impairment is going to minimize the horse's ability to perform at the level needed to win, which means not did the horse buck you off, but did the horse have enough extension? Did the horse get underneath himself? And all the other details that we look for. So dressage horses, and if you're schooling a dressage horse to Grand Prix level, most people realize this is not an overnight process. This takes years to school a hook horse to Grand Prix level. Many horses can't get to Grand Prix performance levels. Part of that is the mental training the horse must go through. But part of that process is the physical development that the horse needs. And I would analogize it to a gymnastic human being because that's in essence what a dressage horse is, is a form of ballet or gymnastics, however you want to phrase it. You can't be a champion gy gymnast without developing the muscles, the flexibility, and so on to do the actions that your body is being asked to do. And a dressage horse is in the exact same situation. That horse has to develop the strength, develop the muscles to be able to carry himself in the ways that a dressage rider is asking him to do. And the lady I mentioned before with owned the Grand Prix dressage horse I was working on, she didn't have a clue to all that. She doesn't ride the horse. She just looks at her horse be very pretty running around the arena. Somebody else does the riding in the training. If you think about it, any repetitive motion, if it to develop strength and flexibility, you exercise it and then you rest it. Then you exercise it and you rest it and you build up the strength and the flexibility. But if you exercise it too much or extend too much or stress it too much, that stress now causes things to begin to break down. And when it breaks down, compensation sets in. Compensation alters the natural pattern of movement in the horse. And when you alter the natural pattern of movement, you are now putting undue stress on places that aren't ready for it. So the idea of dealing with the physical issues, the idea of being able to scan a horse all over, it takes about 30 minutes to scan a whole horse, and to find all these, in some cases, minor physical problems. Major physical problems can come from the horse falling or running into something or some catastrophe. Major physical problems can also come from minor physical problems that went unaddressed and evolved from minor to major. My goal is to get more people to be more aware and to have access to this equipment so they can scan their horse and know, not think, not, oh, it looks pretty good, but to know my horse is okay to do this performance. My horse is okay for training today. And if your horse is physically fit, training goes better, attitude goes better, performance is better. Uh, years ago, I was at a national barrel race championship, and the night before the finals, a gentleman brought over a horse, and he says, my son's riding this horse tomorrow night in the finals in the championship, and we're, we're just not fast enough, just not going fast enough to win. Uh, we're running the low 15s. I think we're going to have to get in the 14s to make this, to win this. And he says, use your, use your thing there, meaning the scanner and the light. He says, use your thing there and see what this horse has got. I, so I scan the horse. The horse has some shoulder problems, neck problems, hamstrings, which are common problems in horses that run hard. And when I got done scanning the horse, the guy asked me, he says, all right, now you tell me, what is all this, all these dots? What are all these problems you found? What do they tell you this horse is doing or not doing? What, what do you think is going on here? 
I says, well, I'm not a vet, so I can't give you a diagnosis, but I can tell you what's going on here. I said, when you're barrel racing, your horse stands still, then it runs as hard as possible, then it tries to slow down as hard as possible, then it tries to make a very tight turn, then it tries to accelerate as fast as possible, slow down as fast as possible, make another thing. This is the process of running a barrel race. That's very stressful on all, every part of the horse's body. I said, because of this horse's hamstrings and shoulder problems, I'll bet you it is not accelerating the way it should. I'll bet you that the horse can't drop its back end when it wants to slow down. Therefore, it comes in slowing down on its front end too much, which a horse will, what they call bounce or pogo, on the front end too much, trying to slow down harshly because it can't drop its back end and use its body and turn its body like it wants. And I said, because of the problems on one side of the neck and one shoulder, more so than the other, this horse is turning one barrel pretty well, and the other direction, it's not turning as well. I can't tell you which direction it's doing right and wrong, because it could be either. But one side of this horse is not matching the other side, so it can't possibly turn both directions equally well. He looked at me very surprised, and he says, that's exactly what the horse is doing. Not pulling his heart off the barrels to go next barrel, not stopping as smoothly, not setting up in the turn and turning, turns left, great, won't turn right worth a darn. I says, unfortunately, you've got to go both ways, don't you? He says, yeah. So I worked on the horse that night. The next day, the, the young man rode the horse in the championship. Uh, we were all packing up. I didn't get to see the championships or anything. The fellow that brought the horse over, his dad came by. He says, well, I want to thank you for working on our horse. And I says, you're welcome. How do you do? He said, we did pretty good. We won. I says, you won what? He said, we won the national championship. Now, he says, when that horse took off, he says, the crowd came to its feet. He says, that horse made the most perfect run you could imagine. Turning left, turning right, accelerated, dropped its back in, coming in the barrel, dropped its shoulder, turned like it's supposed to. He says, it was great. Thank you. He says, how soon can I get one of those pieces of equipment? Now, that's what happens when the horse is physically okay. That's what happens when the horse can use its full potential because it's not hurt, injured, sore, or whatever. But we don't know that unless we have the means to evaluate the horse. We can't see a problem and assume that's all we have to work on. We have to work on the whole horse. And that's one of the concepts that I teach to people is this whole horse concept. Whole horse initially means deal with the attitude and the mind of the horse and deal with the body of the horse. Whole horse also extends to mean dealing with the entire horse's body. But how do you pinpoint those problem areas without this equipment that I'm talking about, because there's nothing else out there that does this. There's some people that can take their hands and go over a horse and feel and find problems and do it really well. Probably not as specifically as the scanner. And getting the horse's physical condition right can make all the difference in the world. Wow. Yeah. It would certainly make a big difference on a barrel racer to be able to accelerate, and decelerate, and turn properly. So now we know the reason that our horse isn't really on the bed. He isn't rounding his back for dressage people. Um, all the things that a dressage horse needs to do. The next step is is to take the gadget and scan him and then work on him, right? What's our next yes. step? Yes, and, and you know you you mentioned the uh, you know the barrel racers having to turn all that stuff. Pretty much every sport that a horse competes in has its own type of stress. Jumping horses have a severe stress on the front end from landing. They have to be really strong to be able to launch to get over the jump. The endurance horses, uh, endurance horses have to go a long way. And when you start an endurance race, you have a horse with X amount of energy. So if you use up all that energy too fast, too quick, you don't finish. And endurance rides are monitored by veterinarians at checkpoints every 15, 18, 20 miles. And they have to they, they check the horses out very thoroughly. And if the horse is not in, in good shape, there's any problems, they pull the horse and you can't go on. So it doesn't matter what the sport is, because in all the sports, the reason these sports exist is because we love looking at these gorgeous animals and the way they move, or we like feeling the speed that they provide for the racetrack, for the barrel race, all these events. It's all about the beauty and wonder of the horse. But the horse is the one that pays the price for this. So scanning the horse all over finds the physical problems, locates where there are issues, and then using light therapy, 
which is safe, completely effective. And even to this day, after 20 some odd years of using this, it still amazes me that I can take a light, a red and infrared light, shine it on a part of a horse's body, and that stimulates the body to heal. The light doesn't heal anything. The body heals. And healing is always a process. It's not an event. You don't flip a switch, now the horse is fine. Yesterday the horse was broke, now your horse is fine. It doesn't work that way. Healing is a process. Severe problems take longer to heal, take more treatment. Problems that are being re-injured by overuse, they're going to take a lot of treatment to get over them because you're re-injuring it constantly. But the key is you've got to be able to find the problems, and then you've got to be able to treat those problems in a safe, effective way. And uh, like I say, we've, we've had such success with this. People that use it swear by it, love it. Uh, it's outside the norm, but so much of what I'm talking about is outside the norm. You also, when you mentioned the dressage and the barrel racers and so on, a rider can contribute to the horse developing physical problems by the poor ability of, the of a person to ride the horse. A saddle that doesn't fit a horse can cause serious compromises in the movement of the horse's body. So there's, there's so many things that come into play. How the horse's feet are trimmed and shaped, that can have an enormous effect on the legs all the way up into the shoulders and everything. So uh, what the horse is fed can create problems for the horse. I've been in situations where horses live in a stall 23 hours a day and get several pounds of sweet feed day after day. That is not conducive. That's like putting your kid in a phone booth and giving him Snickers candy bars and Mountain Dew all day long and wonder why he's climbing the walls. There's things we can do to improve the environment our horse lives in to minimize the problems that we put the horse in stress of getting into. Also, I'll address one more thing that's really critical for this, and that is the ages of the horse. Most horse events start horses very, very young, under saddle, going into competition. In the racetrack world, they have these futurities, and a lot of other sports have futurities as well, for two-year-olds. And starting a horse very young causes a horse to break down in many areas much earlier than it would have ordinarily happened. And when we go back to my sport of endurance racing, I think most of your listeners would agree that if you're going to go 50 miles in four, five, six hours cross country on a horse, or if eight hours or seven hours, or if you're going to go 100 miles cross country on a horse in a day or in 10 or 12 hours, that has to be probably the most severe thing you can do with a horse. Not only because of the galloping, the speed, but the uneven, unpredictable terrain, but also the time, the endurance, the continuation of the stress of trotting and trotting and cantering and trotting and walking and cantering, all for hours and hours at a time. Yet, I can show you 15, 16, 17-year-old endurance horses, and in many parts of the horse world, a 16, 17-year-old horse is old and washed up and may have been washed up for a long time. And I can show you 15, 16, 17-year-old endurance horses capable of winning 50 and 100 mile races. And certainly horses into their 20s that are still competing, not winning, but competing in endurance. So what's the difference? The difference, number one, is that you can't race a horse in endurance until he's five. That's three years older than most horses begin competition. So most endurance horses don't get ridden until they're two, two and a half. And even then, they get walked up and down mountains for strength and, you know, and conditioning with no impact, no concussion. And by the time the horse is five and going into some mild competition, the horse probably has two years of moderate conditioning, plus the five-year-old horse is pretty much fully developed and fully grown. So here again, the age of the horse that we start working a horse, there's that word working, can have a big impact on how long that horse can perform. If we started working them two years later, we would probably triple the amount of time the horse could continue to run. Most people don't realize how many racetrack horses are killed annually because they have to be put down because of life-ending injuries, mainly because they're started too young. I know that contradicts what the industry promotes, but what I'm saying has been documented time and time again. Yeah, and... 
I, I think more and more horse people, especially because we now have better communication due in no small part to the internet, um, are starting to become more aware of things like that. So we touched a little bit on the therapy part. Um, how exactly does the light gadget work? Your technical questions are overwhelming. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, I haven't got a clue. I haven't got a clue. No, I'm just teasing you. Light has been used for so many things. And I don't want to bring religion in or anything like that, but if you ever read the Bible, the first thing it says in the Bible was let there be light. I mean, that's, that's where it all kind of starts. If you turn the sun off, we all disappear pretty doggone quick. Now, so the sun, we all know, helps grow things. You know, our food, is our vegetables, our crops are grown. Without sun, we don't get the crops. Without sun, the planet gets too cold. There's all kind of things that the sun has caused. Now, one of the big things is that we need electricity. We use electricity in our lives. And look at the growth in the last few years of solar energy power, solar light therapy, solar light, excuse me, not light therapy, but solar light being used to create electricity for us. And they always say it's basically free electricity. From, you have to buy the equipment, but you can put big solar panels on your house and minimize or eliminate your electric bill. That's pretty incredible. Some of these are just think a lot of people live in the sun with their clothes off, so they have a nice dark skin for tan, and they like that tan look. All sorts of things we do with light. Well, as I mentioned earlier, when the military invented the laser as a weapon 70-some-odd years ago, the human doctors, especially in Europe at first, thought about doing surgery with something that precise because a laser, even the weapon laser, can cut steel and it can do it very precisely. A lot of manufacturing now uses laser and other types of uh, injections that can cut steel, aluminum, plastics, so precise it's not funny and it's very safe and, and, and very effective. Well, when the surgical lasers were being developed, they were testing on lab animals. And they would do a cut with a knife and a cut with a laser, same piece of tissue, same piece of same part of the animal. And the laser cut would always heal 30, 40, 50% faster and stronger than the knife cut. They initially attributed this incorrectly to the laser having certain properties. When in fact, what it was, was the wavelength of light that the laser was creating. Uh, most commonly today, the light colors that are used are red, blue, and infrared. Blue is outstanding for infections, especially for acne, and it's used in a lot of facial work with light therapy. Red is absorbed readily into the cells and doesn't have a great depth of penetration. It's only about three quarters or five eighths of an inch uh, of depth of penetration, but it's absorbed into the cells very readily. So if you had a small scrape on your arm or something, red light would be very effective on that. Infrared penetrates far, far, far deeper and has much, much greater power. But again, going back to the NASA studies, NASA found that if you mix red and infrared light, you get a much better response overall in all situations than if you used either separately. So we use red and infrared on our therapy tools for the most part because they are the most effective use of the light. The light does two things. It stimulates this healing process in the tissue, which is what the doctors were seeing when they did a cut with a knife and a cut with a laser and observed the difference in how rapidly the laser cut would heal. That's what they were seeing, was the stimulation of the cells to heal faster. Also, healing, as I said, is a process, and this process takes energy. The light energy, like solar panels, absorb light energy and convert it to electricity. These particular wavelengths of light, when absorbed into the cells of a living creature, like a dog or a person or a horse, can use that energy to start this process of healing, of growing new cells, of creating new tissues. So using the light therapy, and here again, there, there have been in the last 20 some odd years I've been involved with this, a lot of companies come out, produce light therapy products and go out of business because they really didn't do their homework. They didn't know what they were doing. Today, there are several companies besides ours who make very good light therapy products. There's nothing on the market as strong, effective, and safe 
and user friendly as our equine therapy unit. Nothing out there is any better than that or even as good as that. But there are other companies that make good light therapy products. There are also companies that make light therapy products which are absolute junk. So if you use a piece of light therapy that is poorly made, poorly designed, and of minimal function, don't be surprised if it doesn't work well. But if it doesn't work well, don't assume light therapy doesn't work. Also, if you used our light therapy unit, which like I said is the best on the market, pure and simple, or another company who makes a good light therapy product, if you use their light therapy product, or if you used a magnet, or if you did an injection, if you use any type of therapy on a horse's hock when the horse was lame or not moving well, and the problem was not in the hock, you're not going to get an improvement in the horse's movement. Not because our light therapy or somebody else's light therapy or the magnet didn't work, didn't help. It's because you didn't know where to put it. So you can have the greatest therapy in the world, but if we're treating your shoulder when the problem's in your neck, you don't get better. And it's the same thing with the horse. The scanner is the key to our effectiveness, but the fact that we have the most effectively designed, the most user-friendly, we only need to treat like a simple sore muscle, things like that, for 20 seconds to get a good response. Now that's a pretty short time. When I mentioned the Bioscan earlier, Bioscan used to treat for two minutes per spot. Well, if you've got 30 spots on a horse, that's no big deal. A lot of these team ropers, barrel racers, endurance horses, racetrack horses, even dressage horses, a lot of these horses that compete at upper levels, they may have 150 points on their body. Muscles, joints, acupuncture areas, all sorts of things. If you've got to treat each of those points for two minutes, you're going to be there a while. So there's a degree of being pragmatic in this therapy where we have evolved it to where we can scan and treat most horses within an hour. And that's a fairly reasonable amount of time. I can remember in the old days with the bioscan, sometimes treating a horse, for two, scanning and treating for two hours. That's a long time to ask a horse to stand still, to ask the owner to be able to do this. Uh, having the greater power in this light therapy device gives us the ability to uh, really not only do a better job, but to expedite how long it takes to do the job and get this horse helped. Yeah, two hours, that would be... Ugh, for everybody involved. Um, my gosh. So I know we kind of touched on this as well, but maybe you could bring us back with one last example. Um, what kind of results have you seen in horses that you've worked with um, with the light therapy over the years? Well, I've probably seen every kind of result you could imagine. Um, obviously, I said there was 54 horses I was called in to work on that were about to be put down uh, for colic and other situations. 53 of the 54 we were able to save. Now, in those situations where a horse is deteriorated to a point of being put down, uh, I didn't scan the horse, treat the horse, and come back tomorrow to do it again. We would actually treat all the points on the horse, stop for a 10 or 15 minutes, go back and treat all the points on the horse again. In a case of a colic, uh, there's certain points that you treat, acupuncture points, really related to stomach, intestines, relaxation, things of that nature. Um, we would start treating those points two points at a time, work our way around the horse, treat all those points, immediately go back and start over again, go back and do it again, go back and do it again. Uh, I worked on a colic horse about two months ago. It had no gut sounds hadn't pee or pooped, uh, sweaty, respiration was erratic, uh, horse's eyes didn't look good, and generally the horse was just in a serious colic situation. My wife and I began to treat this horse, and we treated the horse almost nonstop for about an hour and 20 minutes. However, during that hour and 20 minutes, the horse changed and evolved. The horse began to put out gas almost immediately. Within 30 minutes, the horse had gut sounds on one side and pooped a little bit. With the, with, by the time we finished an hour and 20 minutes, the horse had pooped three times, peed once, drank almost a full bucket of water. Respiration was back to normal. Healthy gut sounds on both sides. Horse was alert, moving, and uh, ready to eat. So 
depending on the condition, most of the time when we work on a horse at someone's request or at an event or whatever, we scan the horse and treat all the points and the horse is not about to die, the horse is not in dire jeopardy, so we will leave the horse and the therapy will make a difference immediately but it usually runs its course in about two to three days. So however much improvement you see from one session three days later is about what you're going to get. Now I'll, I'll also quantify that by saying we've worked a lot of events where people were in top level competition whether it's dressage, jumping, endurance, eventing, racing, whatever. And we would scan and treat a horse each day throughout the competition and usually as the horse was in competition for a national championship or something, the horse's performance might tend to fall off. As we treated the horse throughout the week, each day we would actually have fewer points to treat, meaning the horse was getting better, and the horse's improvement would actually improve through the week of treatment. So there's all possibilities of an application for this. Uh, obviously, people who have show horses or competition horses, for them to, to, to wait for me to show up and work on their horse or somebody like me to work on their horse is not nearly as practical as if they have their own equipment uh, to take care of their own horses, to scan them before they leave for the event, to scan them two or three times the week before the event, to get them in perfect shape or as good a shape as possible before the event, and then have the equipment there to use uh, over and over at the event. A lot of times when we work on a horse, the improvements may be subtle. And I'll give you an example. One of the most expensive horses I ever worked on was a multi-million dollar Arab show stallion. Uh, he was featured at the Scottsdale Arabian show and every year they feature a special horse at that show. And he had been off on the right front a little bit. Not really lame, but just off a little bit in the right front prior to the event. So for seven months, they were treating and, and working with this horse, not with our equipment, but in conventional methods to get this horse fully sound for his appearance as the featured stallion at this show. The horse was 19 at this time, and like I say, he was worth millions and had been one of the most successful breeding stallions in Arabian history. When they got to the show, he was still off in the right front. Not lame, not terrible, but enough that if you were trotting him around to look good in front of a crowd, everybody's going to know he's off. So they hired me, they heard that I was there, they went to my hotel, picked me up, took me back over to where the horse was, and as I started to work on the horse, the trainer told me, it's in the right front, just do your thing on the right front, whatever it is you're here to do, just do the right front and help us figure out what's wrong. To which I responded, if I can't scan the whole horse, I'm not going to touch him. I do the whole horse or I go back to my hotel because you've been screwing around with his right front for seven months and he's still off. I think he has other problems besides the right front. The trainer got very ticked off at me and basically stormed off with a couple of his friends. The owner said, well, you're here to do the horse. I scanned the whole horse. He had problems in the right front shoulder and the left front shoulder almost equally. Think about it. When he's standing still, if his right front was sore, where's all the weight in the front end going to be? On the left front. Well, if his left front's carrying most of the weight when he's standing for months, don't you think the left front's going to get sore too? Also, his left rear was far worse than you could imagine. Hamstrings, glutes, hock, stifle. There was, the scanner went off everywhere on the leg almost. And there were several vertebrae in his back because if he's standing crooked, his back's going to get out eventually. So I scanned and the, the owner looked at me very like dismissal in his attitude. Well, you, my horse can't have all these problems. Treated all the problems. They took me back to my hotel. The next morning, next morning at 6.40 a.m., I got a phone call from the owner. He says, can you scan my horse again today? And can you also scan the five show horses we brought to the event to show? And while you're scanning them, can you train a couple of my staff on how to use this equipment? And can you get me one of these? Well, I laughed, and I says, last night you would hardly talk to me. And I said, I realize you've never seen this before, so I understand your, your, your valid skepticism. But I says, what happened? It's 6.40 in the friggin' morning. He says, we took the horse out at 6 to walk him around and see how he was going to look. He says, not only was he not off, but his famous floating trot, which is what this horse was famous for, this absolutely huge Arabian floating trot. He says, his trot hasn't looked this good in three or four years. That's pretty impressive. Overnight, one night, one treatment. Now... The several points to that in the fact that 
they were working on, as I said earlier, the problem. They were working on the problem, the right shoulder. He's off in the right front. That's the problem. The right shoulder was caused by the left rear. The back problem was caused by the contortion of the two between. The right front made the left front sore. Now, I can't guarantee you which of these three came first, the chicken or the egg, but what I can do is show you what's there right now. And by showing you what's there right now, we then know, not guess, not what if, not suppose, or think, we know where to treat. And by treating with light therapy, which works, that's, that's all I can tell you, it stimulates the body to heal. When you treat all of those problem areas, the overall change in the horse or person or dog can be dramatic. Now, many times this is not dramatic. Isabel Wurst's horse at the Olympics was not lame. It wasn't bleeding. It wasn't broken. It wasn't being defiant in its attitude. Her horse was doing everything she asked. It just wasn't doing it at that detail-oriented, refined level that Grand Prix dressage requires. Now, simple sore muscles, don't you think that a number of physical problems like simple sore muscles are going to impede the horse's ability to get that extension, to round like they want him to, to get underneath himself, to do the things that you want the dressage horse to do? So in many cases, when I work on a horse, the change in the horse is like, oh my gosh, dramatic. In many cases, you don't even see a noticeable change until they actually ride the horse. One of the things that I like about people who compete in team roping and barrel racing, besides the fact that they run their horses hard a lot so they need us, but they race against the clock. Now, if your horse is used to running 15 sevens in a barrel race, 15 fives and 15 sixes and 15 sevens, and that's what your horse, that's where your horse usually runs. And all of a sudden your horse runs 15 twos or ones. In barrel racing, an improvement of a tenth or two is a big deal. An improvement in a half a second is amazing. We have worked on barrel horses that have been 16, 7 horses for years, and now it's running in the 15s. That's a whole different feel to the animal. So an answer to what do we, what do we see, what, what happens after we work on a horse, what we always see is improvement. Sometimes the improvement is in subtleties that it takes competition or the trained owner, trainer, rider to feel. In some cases, it's, oh, my gosh, the horse is a totally different horse. And in some cases, it'll save a horse's life. Wow. <laughs> um, so what is the best... <laughs> so what's the best way for people to get in touch with you? Uh, they can call me at my phone number, the easiest way they might want to get some more information, look at the website, would be to go to summerelltraining.com, and it's S-U-M, like in Mary, E-R-E-L, summerelltraining.com, and then go to the website, and they can see things on our training work, and the, my best-selling book, and the things you mentioned, but they can also go to the therapy page, see the equipment, sit in use, uh, see some of the more of the information that I've talked about here today. If they have any questions or whatever, I would be tickled to have to talk when my phone number is on there. If they want to write it down now, it's 540-384-6220. 540-384-6220. I'm in Virginia. Excellent. And I'll have a One link. more thing I would like to mention. Okay, great. One more thing I'd like to mention is that we're trying to get more of this available to the public, to make it a little more mainstream. In the last couple of years, we've had a number of people get the equipment, not necessarily because they have 25 show horses at home that need it or something, but because they're going to use it as a service type business to scan and treat people's horses for the people that are, have horses in their area. Uh, and this is a very rapidly growing business situation. Now, I don't want to sound commercial, but we charge $100 to scan and treat a horse which for what we can accomplish is a bargain. Uh, it's not uncommon to get five, six, eight hundred dollar vet bills now and still not have anything fixed. So we scan and treat the entire horse for about a hundred dollars. That's a pretty good deal and that's one of the reasons a lot of people will try us because it's affordable. Uh, 
But to a person who's doing this as a business, uh, to scan four or five horses in a day and make four or five hundred dollars a day is not impossible to do. So it's a very rewarding business, both emotionally for the way it helps the animals, but it's also financially a good deal too. Something people can think about if they're not necessarily a world championship competitor or something, they don't have million dollar horses or whatever expensive horses, but they just want to keep their own horses in good shape and they might like to pay for the equipment and use it as a part-time business. That's a possibility too, and we can help with that. Excellent, excellent. So, uh, thank you so much for coming on the show with us today. Um, I know it's been a challenge to get this recording. <laughs> thank you for your patience. <laughs> Um, I know that this is going to help people build better relationships with their horses and to ride and train and compete more effectively. Building a good relationship with your horse is so vital to performing well, it simply can't be overemphasized. And then to take that a step further and have a tool that allows you to effectively diagnose and treat the horse for pain issues, that's absolutely priceless. Another tool that helps dressage riders ride and train and compete more effectively is the My Show Horse Checklist, which is an online tool to help you efficiently pack your trailer for shows, lessons, clinics, or other horse-related events. It's located at showhorseapp.com. That's it for this episode. If you have further questions, comments, please send those to us. We'll be happy to address them or send them on over to Dan, whatever works. Um, and thank you for watching.